He is undoubtedly one of the most infamous murderers in the annals of true crime. The subject of numerous books, TV dramas, feature films, a stage show and even a musical. And his name is usually one of the first that comes to mind when the subject of murder is broached. His waxwitz figure in Madame Tussauds' Chamber of Horrors has outlived scores of recent and in many cases more notorious killers and can still be found there today, well over a century after his crime was blazed across the front pages of newspapers, not only in Great Britain, but in most parts of the Western and English-speaking world. However, ask the man in the street what crime he was convicted of often brings far less response. They all know the name, but many have no real knowledge of why it became so famous. This episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record takes us back to 1910. In April of that year, Haley's Comet has made its first fleeting appearance in the skies since the summer of 1835. A few weeks later, on the 6th of May, King Edward VII's death brings to an end the Edwardian era, when he is succeeded by his son, George V. Other notable events that year see the formation of the Union of South Africa, the first X-ray photographs are developed, and, on Friday, July the 22nd, the first ship to show a telegraphic message is sent to assist in a murder investigation. be a friend's suspicions that eventually led to the transatlantic murder hunt. On Monday evening, the 31st of January 1910, Paul and Clara Martinetti had dinner at 39 Hilldrop Crescent, Holloway, North London, with hosts Peter and Cora Crippen. The two families met on a regular basis and would often take turns to dine at each other's houses. They bid their good night at around 1.30 on the following morning, with Mrs Crippen waving them away from the steps of the house. They were the last people to see Cora Crippen alive. Harley Harvey Crippen, known to friends as Peter, was born in Coldwater, Michigan, USA, in 1862. He was a widower of three years with a young son when he met his future wife in New York in 1893. Born in 1876, she was an attractive 17-year-old aspiring opera singer, the child of a Russian-Polish father and a German mother. Although she had been christened Kunigund Makimotsky, she was known to her friends as Cora Turner, while performing on stage under the name Belle Elmore. The 14 years age difference was apparently not seen as an issue, and the two married shortly afterwards in Jersey City spending the rest of the century in various parts of America, where Crippen worked as a practitioner dealing mainly in quack medicines. In April 1900, Crippen came to London, initially alone, taking a house in St John's Wood, and a position with Munions, a firm that produced homeopathic remedies. He also helped to run a dental practice in New Oxford Street. His wife joined him in August that year, with ambitions to pursue her career as an opera singer on the London stage, Crippen paid for her to have extra tuition, but lacking the real talent to make the big time, she reluctantly turned to a less cultural but more popular musical circuit. Although somewhat limited in ability, she was able to find work in the halls, where she was popular with her contemporaries and quickly made many friends. In due course, she was appointed the treasurer of the Musical Ladies Guild in London. In November 1903, Crippen had travelled to America on business. He was away for over six months, and during this time, Cora became close to Bruce Miller, a fellow American music hall artist. Although he would later deny there was any intimacy between them, Miller wrote Cora a number of very affectionate letters. A year after his return to London, in September 1905, Crippen and his wife moved into the house at Hildrock Crescent, Holloway. Their time apart had clearly caused a change in their marriage, and over the next few years, relations between them gradually began to sour. Cora had always had a fiery temper, and now her personality seems to have undergone some sort of change. She became quick to find fault with her husband, 
and although on the outside they maintained a facade of domestic contentment, the relationship between the two was, from hereafter, under strain. They even took to sleeping in separate rooms. Crippen was not unduly worried at this situation. In the summer of 1907, he himself had fallen for his pretty young typist, Ethel O'Neill, and they had begun a clandestine relationship. If they had chosen to separate at this point, it would almost certainly have saved both from an untimely death. But with Cora threatening to leave him penniless if they parted, Crippen chose to accept the situation, satisfied at least in the comfort of his young mistress. It appears that on the night of the meal with the Martinettis, a fierce quarrel broke out after the guests had left. During the evening, Paul had requested to use the bathroom, and Crippen had remained at the table instead of offering to go upstairs with him to show him where it was. Cora accused him of being rude to the guests. She said it was irrelevant that the Martinettis had visited many times before and that he knew where the bathroom was. She said not only was it terribly bad manners, but also a personal insult to her friends. In a rage, she then told Crippen she was going to leave him once and for all. It was a few days after the meal with the Martinettis that Cora Crippen's absence was first noted. When questioned, Crippen told friends that following a quarrel, she had left him and returned to America. Had Crippen been less hasty and bided his time, it is possible that her friends would have accepted his story. But when, just a short time later, he told them that Cora had suddenly fallen ill and died, their suspicion turned to disbelief. These suspicions were not only heightened when Ethel Leneve was seen to have moved into Hildbrock Crescent and began wearing Cora's jewellery and furs. Deciding they were unhappy with what Crippen had told him, a number of Cora's friends felt it was time they contacted the police. And on Friday, the 8th of July, Chief Inspector Walter Dew of Scotland Yard made a visit to Hildrock Crescent. Dew found Ethel Leneve alone at the house. She told the detective that Crippen was at work and took the officer to see him there. Crippen offered to return with the officers to the house, where he now told a very different tale. He admitted that the story of Cora's death was untrue. Crippen said that he had made this up to hide the shame of his wife leaving him and having run off with her lover, whom he suspected was Bruce Miller. Although there was nothing at this stage to suggest Crippen had committed any offence, Drew warned him that it was in his interest to locate his wife and get the mystery of her disappearance cleared up. Crippen promised the detective he would and said he would place a newspaper advert asking Cora to contact him. Crippen then wrote out... Makamotsky, will Bill Elmore communicate with HHC or authorities at once? Serious trouble through your absence. $25 reward to anyone communicating her whereabouts to box number. Satisfied for now, the inspector left. The visit by the Scotland Yard detectives had clearly unnerved Crippen. On the following morning, he shaved off his moustache and with Ethel disguised as a boy, they fled London. They took a train to the coast and a boat to Belgium. They headed first to Brussels and here they purchased tickets for Canada and caught a train to Antwerp where they boarded the steamer SS Montrose and headed for a new life across the Atlantic. Back in London, Chief Inspector Dew returned to 39 Hildrock Crescent intending to ask Crippen a couple of follow-up questions. Finding the house deserted, he suspected something was now definitely amiss. The police officers carefully searched the entire house, and it was as they made their way into the basement their patience was rewarded. Noticing some loose bricks on the cellar floor, Dew had them lifted. They began to dig, and after just a few inches, unearthed something that looked like it had been buried. Carefully brushing away the earth, they slowly revealed the headless and limbless remains of a human body. The manhunt for Crippen and his mistress was on, with Scotland Yard printing up posters asking the public to be on the lookout for both Crippen and Ethel Leneve. They also took the unusual step of offering a reward of £250 for information leading to their arrest, 
this would be the equivalent of almost £30,000 in 2024. Suspecting the couple may have fled the country and attempted to return to Crippin's homeland, the detective had the seaports of the Atlantic staked out and made a request for all ship's officers to be on the lookout for the missing couple. Although Crippin and Lenevo disguised his father and son, rather than being discreet, such was their behaviour, holding hands on deck for example, that Captain Henry Kendall on the SS Mentors, having seen the request to be on the lookout for anyone acting suspicious, was soon convinced he had the wanted fugitives on board. As the ship passed off the southwest coast of England, he made the historic telegraph message to Scotland Yard. Strong suspicion that Crippin, London cellar murderer and accomplice, are among the saloon passengers. Mustache taken off, growing beard, accomplice dressed as a boy, but manner and build undoubtedly a girl, both travelling as Mr and Master Robinson. Several further communications between the captain and the police took place. Drew decided that they had found their suspects and set out to intercept them, boarding a faster ship, the Lorientic, at Liverpool on the following day. With the eyes of the world watching the chase through the pages of national newspapers and Crippin unaware that he was front page news, the race was now on. On Sunday the 31st of July, the SS Montrose approached Father Point near Ramowski on the final stretch of the voyage. Disguised as riverboat pilots, Drew, with two officers of the Canadian police, boarded the Montrose as it sailed up the St Lawrence River. Unlike the popular image of them being apprehended on deck, the couple were in their cabin when Chief Inspector Drew knocked on the door and placed both under arrest. They were then detained in cabin number five, with a police officer posted outside as Walter Dew sent a telegram back to Scotland Yard. To Handcuffs, London, Crippin and Lenive arrested while later Dew. Three weeks later, with all the relevant paperwork sorted, Dew returned to England with his prisoners. Large crowds gathered on the quayside at Liverpool as the SS Magantic sailed into port where newspaper photographers jostled to get the best pictures of the fugitives on their way into custody and whatever their fate lay ahead. There should be a number of remand hearings before it was decided that Crippen alone would be charged with murder and only once a verdict had been reached in this case would Ethel Lenive face a charge of being an accessory after the fact. On Tuesday the 11th of October the remains of Cora Crippen were laid to rest at London's Finchley Cemetery. The trial of Hawley Harvey Crippen began a week later at the new number one court at the Old Bailey. All the country's legal heavyweights were in court, with Lord Chief Justice Alverson in the judge's seat. The prosecution was handled by Richard Muir, assisted by Travers Humphreys and Samuel Ingleby Oddy, while for the defence, Alfred Tobin led, assisted by Mr Huntley Jenkins and H.D. Room. It was to be the most sensational trial so far in the 20th century. Crippen's defence maintained Cora was alive and in America, and that the body in the cellar was not that of his wife, and that he was therefore innocent of murder and there should be no case to answer. Prosecution claimed that the body was that of Cora Crippen, identifiable by a piece of flesh bearing a scar, and it was known that Cora had a scar on her lower abdomen. All efforts to trace Cora Crippen in the USA had failed and there was no record of her on any shipping manifest or passenger list. Bruce Miller, though, was known to have returned to America. The cause of death was found to be hyacinth poisoning. Crippen was known to have bought five grains of the poison in January 1910 from a chemist shop off New Oxford Street three weeks before Cora disappeared. It was suggested that Crippen had been administering small doses of hyacinth to sedate Cora to calm her temper and make the domestic situation more tolerable to him. It was alleged that by sedating his wife he was able to continue his relationship with Ethel without his wife's knowledge or interference. 
Medical experts found that the amount of drug in the torso was consistent with the victim having ingested half a grain, twice the fatal dose. Despite the stronger convincing medical evidence, the most damning against Crippen was to be the pyjama jacket in which the remains had been buried. Crippen maintained that the jacket was not his and must have been put there by the previous owner before Crippen took residency in 1905. This claim was effectively destroyed when Richard Muir called a representative from Jones Brothers who testified that the jacket had a label inside giving the manufacturer as Jones Brothers Limited Holloway. Jones Brothers had only become a limited company at the beginning of 1909 and therefore the jacket could not have been concealed until after 1905. This, the prosecution claimed, was proof that only Crippen could have put the body there. There was one final piece of evidence, however circumstantial, that told against the accused. Crippen had told Cora's friends she had fled to America with her lover and had fallen ill and died. This last fact would have been quickly exposed the moment Cora wrote a letter or attempted to keep in touch with one of her friends or family. If she had a lot with her lover, why hadn't she written to her closest friends? Muir claimed that the only way Crippen could have maintained this ruse of her dying overseas was true was if he knew he could not be exposed as a liar. And this would have to be because he knew she was dead. Faced with such damning evidence on the fourth day of the trial, the jury took less than half an hour to return their guilty verdict. There was no recommendation for mercy. With the black cap draped on Lord Chief Justice's wig, sentence of death was passed. Bawley Harvey Crippen, who had been convicted upon evidence which could leave no doubt upon the minds of any reasonable man that you cruelly poisoned your wife and, after concealing your crime, you mutilated her body and disposed piecemeal of her remains. You possess yourself of her property and used it for your own purposes. It is further established that as soon as suspicion was aroused, you fled from justice and took every measure to conceal your flight. On the ghastly and wicked nature of the crime, I will not dwell. I only tell you that you must entertain no expectation or hope that you will escape the consequences of your crime. And I implore you to make your peace with your God. The sentence of this court is that you be taken from this place to a lawful prison, then to a place of execution, that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead, and that your body be buried within the precincts of the said prison within which you shall be confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. A large crowd was waiting outside for the verdict and was still there when Crippen was escorted into the horse-drawn police van that was to take him to Pensonville to await execution. Three days later, Ethel Lenny stood trial in the same dock, charged as an accessory of the fight, but was quickly found not guilty and discharged. Tuesday 8th of November 1910 was originally scheduled for the execution but was soon postponed when it was announced that Crippen was appealing against conviction. Ethel Linney visited Crippen regularly in the condemned cell at the grim Victorian jail as they waited to hear the result of the appeal that the remains found in the cellar were not those of Mrs Crippen. On Saturday night, 19th of November, the prison governor at Pentonville entered the cell and informed Crippen that Home Secretary Winston Churchill had failed to allow a reprieve and the law would take its course. Crippen's solicitor, Arthur Newton, visited it on the day before his execution to deal with the final disposal of the house and his personal effects. He said he wanted everything to go to Ethel Leneve. The condemned man remained upbeat and in good spirits until the final tearful farewell with Ethel Leneve in the small visiting room in the presence of four prison officers. As they parted, Crippen blew up down into floods of tears and had to be escorted back to his cell where he collapsed on the bed. As the meeting was taking place, Hangman John Ellis and his assistant William Willis were at work in the execution chamber at the end of B-Wing, rigging the drop in readiness for the following morning. Crippen remained quiet and sullen for the remainder of the evening and before retiring to bed he went into the bathroom. 
Standing outside, one of the death watch officers heard the sound of something cracking. When he came out, Crippinwood searched and a small piece of metal frame from his glasses was found, hidden in his trouser lining. Crippin confessed he planned to puncture a vein as he lay in bed and cheat the hangman by bleeding to death. At nine o'clock on the morning of Wednesday the 23rd of November, his face drained of colour and struggling to keep his composure, Harley Crippin made a short walk to the execution chamber. To just 60 seconds from Ellis entering the cell to Crippin hanging dead on the rope, he was given a drop of 7 foot 9 inches. His last wish that a photograph of Ethel and her letters be buried with him was granted. His body was interred adjacent to the execution chamber, which remained in use until it was superseded by a modern execution suite housed in Airwing on the other side of the prison. Prison folklore is that the ghost of a shadowy figure, neck bent to one side, prowls this area, which was nicknamed Crippin's Grass. As Crippin was taking his last walk to the scaffold, Ethel Leneve was boarding a ship bound for a new life in Canada. History remembers Harley Harvey Crippin as a doctor, but he was never qualified to practice in England and couldn't legally call himself as such. He was a mild-mannered man who, in all probability, had accidentally killed his wife and it was only in panic that made him dismember and conceal her remains and flee for his life back to his homeland. The head and other body parts of Cora Crippin were never discovered and Crippin never revealed what he had done to them. It was believed he may have chopped them into small pieces and thrown them out of a train window when passing through a tunnel. Some months after Crippin was hanged, residents arranged for a competition to suggest a new name for Hilldock Crescent in order to hide its unsavoury past. The competition winner was filleted place and the council rejected the change of name. Following Crippin's execution, the house was purchased by an enterprising Scottish comedian attempting to turn it into a Dr. Crippin museum. Unfortunately for him, he met a fierce resistance from residents and the idea was soon scuppered. The house then remained virtually vacant for the next 30 years, unloved and seemingly cursed. During the Blitz, Hildrock Crescent was hit by one German bomb, which landed a direct hit on number 39, destroying the house and finally wiping away any trace of where Dr. Crippin had murdered his wife. A block of flats, Margaret Bonstead House, was built on the site and now stands in its place. Captain Henry Kendall was presented with the cheque for £250 from Scotland Yard for his vigilance in spotting the fugitives on his ship. On the 29th of May 1914, Kendall was in command of the Empress of Ireland when it collided with a Norwegian tanker and sank off Father Point, Quebec, almost the very spot where Crippet and Ethel Leneve had been arrested. Over a thousand lives were lost in the disaster, but a rescue party saved 465 passengers and crew, including the captain. Kendall was clear of any blame and lived to the age of 91 years old. Six months later, in the early days of the First World War, the SS Montrose was requisitioned by the Admiralty when it broke from its moorings in a gale and drifted onto a sandbank in Kent where it was wrecked. The Dr. Crippen case was the last to feature Scotland Yard Detective Walter Dew, who retired from active duty just three weeks before Crippen was hanged. He was 47 years old, a year younger than Crippen. It was thought his decision may have come around for sympathy he felt for his prisoner. He later wrote an account of the case, I caught Crippen, and died in Worthing, England, in 1947. Ethel Eve left England and settled in Toronto where she worked as a secretary in Canada for five years and writing her memoirs. In 1916, she sailed back to London and married an accountant from Croydon. It was said that her new husband, unaware of her past, closely resembled Harley Crippen. The marriage produced a son and daughter before her husband died young of a heart attack. Ethel never forgot Harley Crippen and kept his memory sacred until she passed away in 1967, a content grandmother. In 1981, a British newspaper reported Leneve had claimed that Crippen had murdered his wife because she had syphilis. 
Another theory is that the body found in the cellar was put there by Crippin after an illegal abortion had gone wrong. It was also claimed that Crippin may have shot Cora in the head, hence having to dispose of it, thus ruling out poison as the main factor in her death. In recent time, scientists have speculated that the remains may have been male, but they were unable to find evidence to present to the Court of Appeal and in December 2009 declared they would not hear the case to pardon Crippin posthumously. For Hangman John Ellis, this notorious case was the first time his name came to prominence as an executioner, and only the eighth time he had pulled the lever, having taken over as the country's chief hangman just a few months earlier following the dismissal of Henry Pierpoint. Ellis would go on to execute over 200 men and women until his resignation in 1924. And one last coincidental fact for students of capital punishment. The last execution to be carried out in Sweden, one of the first European countries to abolish a death penalty, took place when Johan Hander was executed by guillotine on the very same morning that Dr Crippen walked to the gallows. Did Dr Crippen's crime warrant notoriety it has since gained? True, that trying to dispose of the body and attempting to conceal identification makes it difficult to feel sympathy for him if he was guilty as charged. But was he guilty? And were the remains found in the cellar those of Cora Crippen? And if not, what became of her? There were no sightings of her ever again after waving goodbye to her friends after the dinner party. Did she run off to America as Crippen suggested, or did she meet a grisly fate and end up buried in the North London cellar as the prosecution at the murder trial claimed? Perhaps it wasn't her remains discovered in the basement, but like many other notorious and controversial cases in the annals of British true crime, maybe one day the truth will out. Thank you for watching this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like and share and subscribe if you don't already, and until the next time, goodbye.